Thank you, Ayn. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to pay tribute to, to Partha. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about is uh, some joint work that I had done with, uh, with Partha and with Steve Smale, um, and also report a little bit on, on some of the context in which it's embedded. And a big part of the joy of working with Partha it was actually, you know, not so much the individual theorems. It was more the conversations in which things were embedded. And they weren't just mathematical or statistical conversations. I, uh, well, firstly, I mean, he was a wonderful, gentle soul. It was just a pleasure talking to him about, um, about all sorts of things. I, uh, um, the after effects of British colonialism in India, for example. I, uh, but then connecting, you know, but then every... You know, but he, he really was a profound thinker, and lots of different topics that, you know, where his interests were piqued for different reasons would really interact with each other um, in, in surprising ways. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you know, well, I, mean, all, I think many of us who are here, you know, were his friends, and, you know, I think that, you know, I'm just uh, stating what may be obvious to everybody. Um, anyway, so this slide I stole from Partha. Uh, this is the way that he would like to describe uh, the problem that I'm going to be discussing. Um, and, you know, you imagine that you have just a pipe, you know, um, and you puff air through the pipe. Okay? And then after you puff air, you know, what you do is some entirely standard thing, right? There are these differential equations that will tell you, you know, what the wave motion is as a result of you know, as a result of your uh, blowing through the pipe. And the solution, you can actually solve if you're that kind of person. I mean, I personally can't, but, uh, you know, you go ahead and you get, you know, for each pipe, you get a curve in Hilbert space, right? You just think of it as L2. You know, you could use uh, Fourier methods. You have infinitely many coordinates, and that's measurable, right? I mean, you actually hear the pipe when you, when you, when you blow through it, or someone else hears it when you blow it through it. But, if you think about it, right, so now this curve, we're just, this is a curve, which is a function of time, right, which we're now thinking about as living in some Hilbert space, right? Now, as you vary the length, that gives you a curve in Hilbert space, right? The individual curve is a point in Hilbert space, right, it take, which it takes infinitely many coordinates to describe, okay? But now varying the length, because there's really nothing to this, you know, this isn't a flute, okay? This is just a pipe that you're blowing through, okay? So there's nothing to the pipe other than its length. So now you have, this in, you have this curve in Hilbert space, you know, that's based on your observations, right? I mean, that's, you know, you, you know each day someone comes in, gives you, gives you a pipe of a different length, you'll be getting a whole bunch of points. Over time, you make many, many, many observations, and you're going to be getting this complicated curve in Hilbert space. And the question is, how do you learn that the truth of the matter is that there's just one number that's generating all of this complicated stuff? Okay? That was the naive question, uh, you know, that, um, that I think motivated Partha. Now, of course, he was actually interested in the formation of sounds and how we listen to it and, you know, how many numbers does it take to actually characterize sound. But he was interested, first of all, in just this simplest model where you're going to have a curve and then discover how do you determine that a curve is a curve even when it's embedded for you in infinite dimensional space. Okay, so the basic problem is that from no perspective does this curve that you write down look linear. Okay, I mean it's a very very complicated nonlinear function. You know, you're not if you pick some point and then approximate it, you know, and you get some kind of nearest plane, it looks nothing like what it would look like elsewhere. Okay, so the usual methods that infer lower dimensionality don't directly apply, right? Okay, so you want to do something that's essentially non-parametric. Okay, and Partha's slogan I mean, was that manifold plus noise may be, gene may be generic model in high dimensions. Uh, and um, I think what he meant was for situations where you could actually deal with a very, very large dimensional object, the, the hope is that there's some geometrical structure underlying it. Okay? And the project that I want to describe is how would you discover the geometric structure if there were geometric structure? with the hope that the tools you use there might be of value even if the geometric structure, even if there isn't a geometric structure present, or if the geometric structure is further removed 
from the, from the means of producing the data. And the idea of using topology for this problem is that firstly, to a topologist, a curve in Hilbert space is just a curve, it's just a line. And you know, so it's built in as a topological question. And also, um, a topologist doesn't know the difference between you know, that nice, beautiful round sphere and you know, the ugly, perhaps, you know, looking one to the right. Or is it to the left? Well, anyway, uh, one of those is apparently ugly, but they, look, they are the same thing to topologists. And topologists have found interesting things to measure and how to reason about objects that are different in this way. Okay? And that the feeling would be that certain kinds of small perturbations, small in some sense, are likely to not influence topology. Okay? Okay? So now here's the outline for the talk. I just want to really talk about two papers of mine, of mine with Partha and Steve. And um, given that it's a half hour talk, I thought I would just uh, sort of mention one paper, then do a, a question and answer, where I do both parts, like I'm following Galileo here. I mean, I'll ask questions <laughs> and I'll give answers, you know, because otherwise I couldn't do it on transparencies. I can't let, really anticipate it so well. Okay, and then I'll talk about the second paper. Okay, so the first paper is some, says this. Suppose that you start off with a compact submanifold of Euclidean space, and suppose that the tau tubular neighborhood of M is still embedded. Okay, so let me just say what this means. I think I actually have a, where's the picture of that? Uh, oh, here's a picture uh, later. Okay, so if you have a manifold, so a manifold is just something that in the small is a curved version of Euclidean space. Okay, so then there's a little neighborhood of it which is still embedded. If you look at your manifold and it's in Euclidean space, at each point it has some normal direction. And then there's going to be some point at which the normal directions begin colliding with each other. Okay? Okay? So that's what this number tau is. It's the first point, it's the first time where the normals begin colliding. Okay? It's some statement about sort of how thick you could find a neighborhood around, um, around that, around that uh, set. Okay? So you assume that that's still embedded. Then the theorem says that if you have enough points sampled uniformly from the manifold, Okay, and enough is determined via diameter or volume and this number tau. Okay, this number tau plays an important role. Then one can, has a high probability of correctly computing the homology of M. Okay, correctly. All right, I, that, that one. Okay, and then here's the theorem, okay, which I don't think that I really read. Um, you know, that gives you some more of the, of the data. So, um, Hey, this tells you, you know, how many points you have to choose if you want to have a certain degree of certainty in computing a certain topological invariant. Okay? And the theorems quantify what are the sort of the relevant features that you need to have um, in order to be able to do this. Okay? So now, I mean, mathematically, I guess the significant point here is that homology is, usual, is usually defined as a limit. By the way, I do have a slide not saying what is homology, but saying why compute the homology. Okay, so for people who aren't so familiar with homology, um, I'll get around to that. But the point is that hom homology are, you know, I said topologists have ways of talking about topologically equivalent things, right? So there are some lists of adjectives that are reasonable and some that are not, right? Like discussing, you know, about whether it's pointy or not, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because the left had no points and the right-hand version did have points. But there are other things, like whether it's connected or disconnected. There are various, some things make sense and other things don't, and homology is one of the things you could compute. Okay, we'll get, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Okay? Um, and, you know, mathematically, I guess the point is that homology is usually defined by a limiting process, and, you know, one of the points that you need to do here is find a scale um, at which you don't have to take limits anymore. Okay, I mean, so that's sort of what's involved. It takes... Um, you know, some kind of multi-scale pro problem and deals with it in, in a single-scale way, okay? Whether or not that's going to be, you know, the point of view that you want to use in general, uh, you know, that's a different matter, okay? And it says that the homology of the manifold is the homology of some set U, and this is a picture of U, okay? This is U, uh, if you're Nina Amenta's foot, okay? Uh, so just what the basic process is, okay, is that you imagine your space, you sample it, and you would take a union of balls around the various sample points. Okay, now in Nina's work, she used adaptive balls, 
okay, such that she took really smaller ones for the crease between toes, and you get a nice picture like this. And in the theorem that, you know, Partha, Steve, and I did, we don't do any of this adaptive stuff because we were just having a proof of concept, right, that you can compute it. And so what we ended up doing was sort of choosing the smallest one possible, which therefore makes it somewhat inefficient in terms of what the sample complexity is, okay? It doesn't take advantage of some of the features that you might actually in practice want to take advantage of, but it, it's the first theorem that uh, tells you conditions um, under which you could compute um, topological invariance. So here are the questions that I want to ask. Uh, why manifold? Why tau? I said you sampled it uniformly. How do you sample it uniformly? Uh, what about noise? Don't outliers kill to the topology? Okay, why compute homology? Maybe the questions are in the wrong order. Um, and are the estimates correct? Okay, and then I'll talk about the, the second paper. Uh-oh. There it is. So firstly, it's a reasonable first test, right? I mean, we were interested in if there is geometry, can you find it? And the manifold hypothesis is, you know, very common. Anything else that's not a manifold is more complicated than a manifold in some sense. Okay? Um, Secondly, um, this, is, this is a generalization of something that's really common practice already in statistics, which is the mixture of Gaussian models. Right? Sometimes when you have complicated data and it's, not, right, and it's not itself a Gaussian, you imagine, oh, well, really what's happening is that there are two populations, or three populations, and each of them is Gaussian, and they're just configured in different ways, et cetera. So, the, right? so in that case, the point of, you know, how does that underlie a geometric picture? Well, you're supposed to imagine all the Gaussian, which is, of course, to the statistician, the interesting part. You think of all that, oh, all that is noise. And what's really interesting is the fact that there are three populations. There are three centers. Okay? So the question is, you know, identifying, you know, so, you know, the analog of the problem of finding the homology of M is finding how many centers there are. Okay? So, except that in the mixture of Gaussian model, we always imagine finitely many Gaussians. And here we're imagining a continuum. It's parameterized by a manifold. Okay? And then for non-manifolds, there are roughly speaking two different cases. One is called stratified spaces, and then the other ones are called not. You know, sort of wild monsters. Uh, you know, things like fractals live in the other one. And certainly for some geometrical models, fractals will be the appropriate thing, especially if there's some dynamics going on, you know, and that something is approaching an attractor and that that's all you ever see. Okay? And then, the, you know, nothing that, you know, and then the questions you want to ask are really rather different than this. In situations, you might imagine something is parameterized by a bunch of equations of degree bigger than one. Okay? And then you might have objects with singularities, or you might have um, objects with boundary and things like that. Say a manifold with boundary is an example of a stratified space. It really has two strata. It has the boundary and it has the rest. Okay? And it's locally different at those two places. Okay? Um, so a lot of what, so I mean, the basic point is that firstly, the manifold case is the first case because it's the situation where you only have one stratum. And when you get, move on to stratified spaces, you have to be careful. Okay? Uh, there are many things that you can say about them, but unfortunately, it's algorithmically under, the most basic question you would ask is, where are the singularities? And that turns out to be algorithmically undecidable. Okay? So I mean, even if you have a, a space given to you as a union of polygons, higher dimensional polytopes, a union of simplices, then you can't algorithmically decide where are the singular points or how many singularities are there. Okay? So there are things that, you know, so if things are undecidable, you don't expect to find nice algorithms to compute them. Okay? So there's a limit to what one should do in generality. So what one has to do is, you know, pick one's problems. Okay. So now let me get on to tau, and I already showed you this slide, and it's roughly speaking a condition number, right? So when you do numerical analysis, right, I mean, very often you have to invert a matrix. And we all know that, you know, how hard your problem is going to be is at first, right, I mean, a very key issue is how small is the smallest eigenvalue, okay? Because after all, if it were zero, then they lied to you when they told you it was invertible, okay? Right? So, so too here, right? I mean, if you had sort of a tau that was zero, that would mean that you know, the thing really had a cusp or it wasn't really a nice smooth manifold. Okay? And this picture shows, by the way, that tau has two aspects. You see, there are places where tau is measuring something local, okay, and it's measuring curvature over here, 
Okay? And at these points, tau isn't really a curvature effect. It's a more global effect. Right? It has to do with the fact that these two parts of the manifold have normals that hit each other. Okay? So this is sort of, so it's sort of a reasonable kind of condition number. Okay? Okay? Uh, but there are many variants of this uh, that one could use, some of which are called uh, homological feature size. And they play a, a very big role when you leave the manifold setting because, as I said, when you're in non-manifold, then tau should be zero, but you need some substitute. And there are th other things to do. Okay? But the fact that you need something is just try to consider, suppose you had an annulus. You had two circles, you know, two parallel circles, and they're just close to each other. And you would be sampling from, from those. If you, you know, and you imagine that it's some kind of noisy sampling. If you, don't, if you believe that tau is large, then you'll think that this is just noise around a single circle. And if you believe that tau is small, then you will you know, discover the truth that there were two circles. Except that tau was even smaller, and there was a third circle that was you know, just one angstrom off from the middle one. Okay. Okay. But anyway. Okay. So um, if you sort of, um, now, you know, so that's sort of, I've answered the question, why tau from the point, you know, from the point of view, why have anything, right? There's sort of a different kind of question that you could ask in terms of context, which is maybe tau is asking for too much, okay? And if you just think, you know, what would be the least kind of hypothesis, you know, that would enable some kind of topological sampling theory, it would be what are called LC row spaces. Okay, so this was, what I'm about to describe maybe is a pitfall that Partha and Steve and I avoided in our paper, because it, it leads to very beautiful and very difficult mathematics. Okay, um, but, the, but the point is that there are, I mean, so LC rho means that you can, that whatever things are actually occurring on a small scale, you can predict a larger scale at which that stuff goes away. Okay, so imagine, you know, well, in fact, I mean, instead of this being a thimble, just imagine this looking like this. If I take a point here and I look at a ball, it will intersect this thing in a disconnected set, okay? But, there, but the, it's predictable how far I have to go before the two, before the two components actually uh, become one component, okay? So this is some statement that there's, you know, even though it looks like there's topology on some small scale, there's a predictable larger scale at which it goes away. Okay, and things like this actually do occur. I don't know if they occur, you know, in any kind of data, but they occur in various mathematical settings. And, um, and somehow one could imagine a sampling theory for this. And there's a, a wonderful theorem that says that if you have sufficiently close spaces, okay, where close is in the sense of uh, you could just put them right next to each other, okay? For people who know about gromov hausdorff space, that's the meaning. But if you don't know about gromov hausdorff space, it doesn't matter. I have x and y, and I imagine taking any kind of rigid motions, and I could move x and y to be within epsilon neighborhoods of each other. Okay? Then the theorem says that if you have this LC row condition, then if they're close enough, then they're actually homotopy equivalent, okay? which then means that all of these invariants like homology are the same. Okay. So that's sort of a, a good positive theorem. Uh, the only bad news is that the analog for homeomorphism is false even for manifolds. Okay. So what tau does um, is it sets up saying that what we're going to just do is look at the function rho of x equals x. And to be a function, you also need a domain. And it's the domain is the interval 0 tau. Okay. So if you lower tau, it's officially a different function. Okay. And the function sort of matters, okay? Um, but anyway, but, um, the next, so ne uh, next question on the list was, what is the measure? Okay, so if I have a submanifold of Euclidean space, it gets a measure automatically, okay? I mean, there's the Riemannian measure, okay? It but it's sort of a weird choice to make. And again, it was sort of part of the proof of concept nature of that paper that we chose uniform, because in the mixture of Gaussian models, it would be sort of saying that I'm going to be sampling from every population equally. And there's no reason at all to ever make an assumption like that. OK? Um, so what, it, what it suggests is, though, that the right uh, context for these kind of sampling theorems are not just measure spaces themselves, metric spaces themselves, but metric spaces together with an added measure. Right? So, Okay, so those are called metric measure spaces, and the same part of mathematics that brings you LC rho, 
you know, comparison differential geometry. Um, used to just study metric spaces, but it studies metric measure spaces, and those occurred, for example, in Perlman's proof of the Poincaré conjecture. I mean, they're sort of very natural mathematical reasons for studying them. Um, and it's also the, really the correct place to be studying these kind of sampling theorems. Because, the, I mean, in some sense, the space itself comes from our description of where the data should be coming from. What are the measurements, we're, the kind of measurements we're taking? Uh, the measure that comes is usually, you know, at least if we're passive observers of nature, is the measure of how frequency do certain, you know, certain amount of things occur. And that's really the thing that we want to be learning, the space together with the measure rather than just the space. So, I mean, um, so I accept this critique. I mean, Steve might yell at me later. Um, now, the next question is, what about noise? I mean, does it, don't outliers just kill the topology? So, um, so firstly, uh, the second paper is all about noise, okay? And that's why we wrote it. And it also deals with this issue about lack of uniformity uh, to some extent. But it is really a problem. So, one, like I said, one of the features of topology is that one of the things that you want to measure, say, is how many components, right? Which is the analog of how many clusters are there. Okay? And of course, if you have one outlier, you know, and you don't do anything at all, you just keep track and, you know, you believe in that outlier, then you're going to say, oh, well, you know, th this is a population, you know, one thing is nice and connected, plus there's one point out there, and that's genuinely disconnected. Okay? I mean, that's just the way topology works. Okay? Right? I mean, the space really has two components. I mean, if you take it too literally, okay? which the tau hypothesis tells you not to do, you might have said, if I have n points, that's always going to be n components because they're never close to each other. But with a tau hypothesis, you know that the nearby points really have to get connected to each other. Okay, that's sort of uh, how that works, right? Um, so that's sort of, you know, so on the one hand, you know, you, you run into this problem that it really should mess up topology. On the other hand, the fact that you deal with it gets rid of some of, some of the overfitting. So I don't have a blackboard here because I couldn't draw it on the screen. Um, but if, for example, you know, let me test your imagination. Suppose that you take the letter X. Your space is literally X, okay? And now you choose a whole bunch of points that are nearby, okay? Now you take big balls around those points and just look at the union, okay? So you all see that? Okay, so what does it look like? Uh, does it matter? So tell me what are your choices. It looks like a funny X, right? That's the right answer, yeah. If you take a really big balls, that's, I know what you're saying. If you take really big balls, it looks so un X like, it looks mainly like a ball, mainly it looks like a blob, okay? And then what I should have, you know, told you to pick the letter Y. No, that one won't help. Uh, o, the letter O would have then had this feature. And then the problem is the balls that are larger than, than the distance to the center, right? And now you're seeing tau playing a role, okay? But the fact that it basically looks like an X Right? That means that you're not doing any overfitting. You're not asking any question other than the x-ness of the space x. Okay? Okay. So, um, but it turns out that you could just go ahead and now ask, you go ahead and you have these measures, you, there's this algorithm that computes homology. What happens if you apply it to pure noise? Uh, so Robert Adler and uh, um, a student of his, uh, Omer Bobrowski, and I calculated what happened. And it's sort of amusing. For Gaussian noise on Euclidean space, you go ahead and you do the algorithm, and it gives you that this homology that you get by sampling is that same thing as a point. Okay? But if you would have had an exponentially decaying tails rather than Gaussian tails, um, then, an actual, then if you have n data points, it grows like log n to the d minus 1, where d is the dimension of the Euclidean space. I, I forget what happens for d equals 1. It's more complicated. It's more interesting, actually. It has some self-similarities. Um, so anyway, so it, it emphatically gives you the wrong answer, okay? Um, right? Because if it's just pure noise, we don't want to impute a geometry to it, okay? And this quantitatively says the problem. Um, I mean, actually, the, the, the theorem is misleading uh, because, uh, because the font is too small, uh, but, but also because um, when you're Gaussian, it, it gives you, the, it's just because you did pure noise. But it turns out, for exactly, you know, this big ball problem, uh, when you're Gaussian, it predicts that you get zero for every space when you take it and you convolve it with Gaussian noise. So, I mean, you know, so I mean, it, it's definitely um, important to, um, ooh, to uh, get rid of, to get rid of the noise. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, skip a little bit and not talk about computational complexity. So the basic, so um, homology includes a lot of interesting and important invariants and things that you would really care about. Okay, so one thing is, you know, that I mentioned is that the components correspond to clusters, okay, which is one thing of interest. The dimension of a space is, is measurable in some way out of the homology. Okay, so that's the number of degrees of freedom. It also gives you some information about, um, you know, what happens if you make errors and stuff like that. Okay? Um, Another thing that isn't homology but comes out of the same thing as the fundamental group, things about entropy. If, you, if you're thinking about this data as, say, being the possible temperatures or something, you know, I mean, some kind of possible states of weather in some system, okay? So then it might be high dimensional because you're keeping track of temperature, pressure, you know, wind velocity. It's a higher dimensional set. And you're interested in doing dynamics. You want to know from a point today till a point tomorrow, you know, you know can, what, how much does it take to actually do prediction? Okay? So it turns out that there are topological invariants of the set that you can use to give lower bounds on entropy and discover how far into the future prediction is at all feasible. Okay? So that's, again, something that's measurable off these invariants. Okay? Uh, there are other ones that Euler characteristic, but I will uh, skip that one. And are the estimates correct? Um, well, yes. They're true. Um, but I mean, what I, what I just want to say in these, just because I want to get to the next paper and I realize that I'm going too slow, um, is that they tell, you know, qualitatively a correct story, but they don't quantitatively tell the correct story. There are various places where we had been shy by exponentials off what's the truth, okay? Exponentials in terms of dimension and things like that. And that's, you know, so, so you know, I mean, it's not optimal in that situation, but on the other hand, it measures the right parameters. So where we say that something is an exponential, the truth seems to be an exponential just with, instead of being, you know, E, it might be 2, or something like that, right? I mean, it's some lower number in the base of the exponential. So you can improve it a lot, but it seems to really be measuring what the right complexities um, of this problem are. Um, there's one aspect that we didn't take into account that I think will in practice be important, which is um, that... Um, for example, if you, um, what the theorem says is that as you get a higher and higher dimensions for the space, right, for the, for the object you're trying to detect, right, so when we're looking at this curve in Hilbert space, that dimension is one, even though Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, okay? But as you look at higher dimensional objects, the invariants really become harder to compute, okay? And there, at least we have some theorem to that effect that, uh, the difference between the zero-dimensional stuff and the d-dimensional stuff is by a factor of 2 to the d in terms of sample complexity. Okay, so that's a theorem, and presumably, um, you, know, uh, you know, other things are in between. Okay, okay so uh, let me now just get to the second paper, uh, which just appeared. And what it qualitatively asserts is that if you have a somewhat uniform distribution, it's not uniform, but it's, you know, not too lopsided, Okay, and in, you have some noise where, the, again, the size of the noise is measured in terms of the basic invariant tau. Okay, then it's possible to clean the data such that afterwards you could use the previous algorithm. Okay, so it's sort of a two-step process. Okay, and the quantitative version of this theorem says that if the noise is in some way Gaussian, then it doesn't depend on the dimension of the, of the ambient space. It only depends on the dimension of the subspace. Now, this is, of course, important for the original question, right? I mean, the original question wasn't just detecting things. Okay, that's that line. Uh, right, it's a matter, right? I mean, you want to understand how, do this, how does the sample complexity grow in terms of the, the sizes of objects, and when it, if it would grow at badly in terms of the ambient dimension, that would be some kind of bad news, right? I mean, we, we really want this to be invariance of the underlying geometry um, of the generating set, okay? And the theorem is that, at least in the Gaussian model of noise, that's true, and I don't expect anyone to read this, but you could read it online, okay? There's an alternative version, by the way. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, there's another version uh, that uh, Chazal, Kohn, Steiner, um, and, Mer and Mary Jo, 
uh, have, have used, which is more in the nature of machine learning, okay? where instead of trying to sample the geometric object, you think about it as trying to compute the homology of some sublevel set of a function. And then you want to be computing that function, and you do that in terms of the data. And, they, and you use machine learning ideas to estimate the function. And um, I suspect the two methods have more or less the same range of application, but I think that, the, you know, I kind of think that theirs is pretty ele elegant. So for this one, I just have two questions and maybe two minutes. So one is, aren't we just computing the radon nicotine derivative at, you know, in, of our empirical sample set in some way and throwing away the points with small radon nicotine derivatives, calling those outliers? I mean, is there anything else going on here than that? And then and the answer to that is no, that's not what we're doing. Okay? So if you see a picture like this, let me ask you, what does this, you know, what does this data look like to you? Okay? I think there are three possibilities. It's a point, and that circle is experimental error. It's a circle, and that point is experimental error. Or the whole damn thing is, no. Uh, <laughs> or it's a circle union a point. Right? I guess there is the possibility it's all experimental error. Okay? So, right, I mean, those seem to be the votes. And at least, you know, me naively, I thought that it was either the point is the truth and the circle is experimental error, or it was a union of a circle and a point. Okay? Um, you know, in, in other versions of this, what happens is, I mean, this point actually is a, pla the, is, is a place where the radon nicotine derivative is extremely high. Okay, I'll tell you how this was uh, generated. One took a circle, and you took a Gaussian normal to the circle with a, with a small, with a not too small, I mean, but um, standard deviation, and then you scattered points you know, according to, that con according to that process. The radon nicotine derivative at the origin is infinity. So if you were to go ahead and clean things via radon nicotine derivative, you would have just gone ahead and said that this point is, you know, that's the only one. Everything else has a very tiny fraction of it, and you'd throw away the circle. Okay? And the method that we use actually does the reverse. I mean, it says that if you had a geometric source of the data, then it says that the right source is a circle and that this point is an artifact. Okay? I mean, that's what the method actually picks up on. Okay? Um, you also have to assume some kind of tau for that? Yes, you have to assume some kind of tau. Right? But if you chose a tau that was say, something around this, around this size, you know, and you, know, you had around there, you know, that would, you know, I mean, that's entirely plausible looking at the data. You would have guessed that tau should be macroscopic. Okay? And it would, you know, and then it would pick this up. OK, you're right. If you would, with too small a tau, then it would, you wouldn't be able to know, and you probably would predict that it's a union of a circle and a point, I think. I think if you made that mistaken guess on tau. OK, uh, so my time is up, so I won't discuss the answer to the other question. I don't remember what it was.